Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So this is uh, the second episode of Kashkul Colloquia Islamica, and today I am very pleased to welcome uh, my very good friend, Wahid Azal from Australia. Wahid is an independent scholar, and uh, his great expertise is in uh, Shihab ad Din al-Suhrawardi, whom we're going to talk about today, but I should add that Wahid is also an expert on the history of the Baha'is, as well as um, the Bayan and the Bayanis, or also known as the Babis, but that's a whole other topic. <clears throat> And Wahid also is the head of the Fatimiya Sufi Tariqa. And he has uh, spent many years researching Shahab al-Din al-Suhrawardi. And today, we would like to uh, look at Shahab al-Din al-Suhrawardi in more detail, but especially a dimension of his life and work, which um, of late or for far too long remained somewhat neglected. Um, what I like to call the theurgic dimension of Shahab al-Din al-Suhrawardi, especially his um, special invocations to um, what I would refer to as the planetary intelligences, but I'll leave Wahid to elaborate on that himself. Um, I think it's very interesting that Shahab al-Din al-Suhrawardi has been neglected in this way. Um, he was, of course, uh, given a great deal of attention and really brought... Um, you know, his really attention was brought to the world uh, by, or the wider world outside of the Islamic world, especially the Persianate world by the French Orientalist Henri Corban and in his work. Um, and uh, Corban did <clears throat> in the relevant volume of his book on Iranian Islam, which was written in French uh, on Islam Iranian, uh, talk about uh, Suhar Wardi and also this dimension. Oddly enough, I think that, that volume has been translated into English, like unofficially it's floating around on the web as under the heading of Suhrawardi and the Persian Platonists. And somewhere in there, there is a footnote to this um, dimension of Suhrawardi, his uh, Kitab al-Waradat with Taqdisat, if I'm not mistaken, by Korban, but he doesn't really follow up on it in his later career. And um, it's sort of forgotten. Mm. And even though, you know, Sayyid Hussain Nasr then worked for many years to get out the complete works of Shahab al um, at least in the edition that I have, which was printed, or well, it was originally published, it's been printed many times since then, but originally published in the, the heyday of what at that time was called the Imperial Iranian Academy of Philosophy under the patronage of none other than the Shah Banu herself. And of course, run by the very supercilious Sayyid Hussain Nasr, and, um, but that volume never made it in there. And, and now I don't know what he, even now, I think there has been a kind of complete works of uh, the Shaykh al-Ishraq as he is known published in Iran, but I don't know if that volume or if that part of his work has been published. Um, is, that, is that so? Sure, but let me, before I talk, I wanna just sure. sacralize our, 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 uh, our talk with the, the Proceed, uh, with the, ex the short exordium of the Sheikh of Ishraq himself from the Kmat al Ishraq, where he said, Jalla Zikrika la Umma, wa Azama Putsika, wa Azza Jaruka, wa Allah Subhatika, wa Ta'ala Jatika, wa Sarada, wa Stafinika, wa Ahner Salatika, woman, wa Hususan, Allah Muhammad al Mustafa, Sayyid al Bashar, wa Shafi al Mushafa, al Mahsha, Alehi, wa Alehim Salam. Um, yes, yes, very good. To, to begin, or Amma Bad, um, <laughs> to begin, um, Korban actually translated uh, parts of the Kitab of Waradat al Taqdisat. In fact, he was the first Western scholar, together with Paul Krauss, that uh, indicated this very important work of the Sheikh al Israel. And in one of the treatises of the Archange in Fufe, the Cr Crimson Archangel. Crimson Archangel. Uh, yeah, Ak where he translated Persian, right? Ak yeah, Ak -Nusuf. Ak -Nusuf, where he translated all of the visionary treatises of mm. Sohuadi. He also included uh, a kind of an anthology of sections uh, uh, of the Wada of Together with a French, very important yeah. in French, together with a very interesting analytical 
the introduction where he actually, in, you know, analyzes in his Corbinian way uh, most of these prayers and situates it, as it were, in the way that Corbin meant by that, yeah. uh, th these prayers. And although he doesn't say this, he kind of alludes to it that, you know, one cannot really approach um, the, the central corpus of the writings of Sopho Ardi, whether we're talking about the Hikmet al Ashraf or these visionary treatises, without recourse to this, and that he, he indicates that this is a sort of prophetic text. Now, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, we, we all know that, that, that the central aim of the Sohrawardian theosophy of life is ta'allu. Ta'allu, uh, probably the, the best translation would be theurgy or the theurgical craft. Um, this you was the to theosis um, which or is, theosis, theosis, a, yeah, yeah, as an active. I, I, I got that off of Sajjad Rizvi. I don't know if he invented it, but yes, he had, yeah, yeah, theosis. Well, I mean, you know, theurgy being the path, theosis being the goal, you know, um, yeah, <clears throat> where then the, the theosopher or the hakim uh becomes a mota'alle, someone who is uh theosicized, as for, to use that English word, um, or coin <laughs> one. <laughs> So this, this, this is a very important element of Sohrawardi um, that is very neglected. Like, for example, even in the introduction uh, by Hossein Ziai and, and John Walbridge, their edition of the Hikmet al in the introduction, they kind of dismiss this stuff. You know, they say, for example, one, one thing that Walbridge Ziai say in the intro that, that these visionary treaties are actually, you know, of no account to the overall philosophical pro project of, they're just flourishes, you know. But one might, one might observe here that um, Dimitri Gutas is to Ibn Sina as Walbridge Ziai is to Sohawati. <laughs> I would say more Walbridge than Ziai. I mean, I, 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 was, ZIA, I was briefly Ziai's grad student and I had yeah, extensive sure. discussions, debates, arguments with him um, in, inside and outside of his office about this stuff and Corban and Sohawati. And, you know, to be fair to the memory of the man, he was, yeah. uh, Ziai had his reservations about Corban, some of which are to some degree, in my opinion, valid, but he was not, he was not on a campaign against Henry Corban. Mm -hmm. Walbridge is on that campaign, you know, against Henry Corban, very, very markedly too. But this statement by them in the introduction to their edition of the philosophy of, of illumination, or Kmet al is quite revealing because um, when one reads, whether, you know, the logical uh, section of the Hikmat lecture, the first section of the book, yeah. goes into the second section of the book, which deals with the lights, um, there is a lot of echoes to these things that occur in the visionary treatise, particularly the tale of the Occidental Exile, but more so the, the you know, overtly ecstatic elements that we find in the Waridat Watak Nisad itself. Mm -hmm. um, now, this text of the Wadidat with Taknisad itself is, is basically divided into two sections, or the way that it has been compiled is in two sections. Uh, one is a sort of a revelatory uh, section beginning with this Raqim uh, Mugattas um, and uh, what Korban has, has then labeled the litanies that then follow it, where uh, the, the soul begins its ascent. Uh, through the celestial spheres. And then the following section um, are the actual prayers. So you have prayer or, or uh, the taktiv sat, as it's, it's correctly labeled, where there's a, you know, there's a daily prayer to God, then the seven intelligences, etc. Yeah. And then there's a longer one uh, that incorporates all of these elements, uh, one I did a critical text of. Uh, and then there is a prayer to the perfect nature, the Tabah um, right. etc. Yeah. Right. Well, it's interesting you bring up uh, Walbridge in, in the context of the um, um, coming to light of, of these texts of, of um, Sohrawardi. And you rightly said, you know, you talked to me, reminded me of the, how, how extracts were published in, in the French edition of the Akhle Sorch or the uh, Crimson Arch Angel. <clears throat> but then it seems to me that there really wasn't any serious attention given to this. And then all of a sudden, decades later, Walbridge in a piece which he wrote for some sort of a publication which I think is published in Russian and some other languages, but I think it's put out by an Estonian fellow yeah. named Janis Estos or Estos. I'm not sure how to pronounce the name and I'm, you know, if you're listening, forgive me, I, I'm really not sure how that's pronounced. 
but it's published um, and you know I saw it on the web with the Cyrillic script and everything but there's you know multilingual submissions and Walbridge had something there and he nowhere nowhere credits Corbin Walbridge. and you called him out on that on your blog which, which yeah. I can't find anymore uh, your blog but uh, you called him out on that and of course there was nothing and then I think there was a brief mention Albeit it wasn't in a scholarly publication or any kind of publication that had even any pretensions to being a scholarly publication, published by um, Zia Inayat Khan of the mm. um, Sufi Order of the West, Sufi Islamia Ruhaniyat Society, or whatever it's being called now. You know, he's the son of Pir Vilayat, who's the son of Hazrat Inayat Khan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was some sort of an English version in that. It effect. was a. It wasn't a translation. This was a translation done by um, one of the Marines of the Sufi Order. One of Here's Zia and Ayat Khan's Murids. Right. Um, it was a kind of a poetic rendition of uh, the, the Tat we sought. Yes. Um, but even though it was a poetic rendition, it actually paid far more closer attention to the only text that was available to this gentleman, Jamal Atala. Um, yes, you know, right. detail, Jamal Atala, yeah. yeah. Details that Walbridge missed. Uh, by the way, that review I did of Walbridge's article is actually on my academia review page. So okay, still, good. So, so listeners yeah, yeah. can find that if they just search yeah. your name and Wahid Azal on academia.edu. Academia, you, you can find you can find yeah, that review. Yeah, yeah. But Walbridge, I mean, despite the fact that 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 you know he did not give a single citation to Henry Corbin, who'd already done work in this area <laughs> several yeah. times in yeah. this in Islam and Iran, yeah, and also in La Arkansha. Um, yeah. didn't read the manuscript of the Hagia Sophia manuscript on the section dealing with the prayer of the Venus correctly. Yeah. And this is just, was mind boggling to me. He says that, uh, you know, Suhra Wardi uh, calls uh, the, the, the intelligence, the planetary intelligence of, of Venus, Osman, a name of unknown uh, origin. When actually, when you read the manuscript, it's, it's Arman Asbahar. Which is the correct Pahlavi uh, designation for, for Venus? Right, and that that just that just blew me away. That this is you know one of the most eminent scholars of Islamic philosophy, purportedly an expert on Sohobardi, who has you know who's had access to far more of these manuscripts than I have had, mm -hmm. uh, yet is incapable of correctly reading a very critical part of a manuscript that he's trained to read. Well, that certainly um, doesn't inspire confidence, but. It also begs the question that if Walbridge is completely um, discounting this dimension or ignoring this dimension of Suhrawardi, then why all of a sudden in that issue of Ishraq does he decide to call attention to it? Well, well I was after that. I was after these manuscripts for a long time, and Walbridge knew about it as well. Um, uh -huh. Luckily, uh, you know, Zia and Ayat Khan. Um, you know, I, I owe him because he sent me the first copy of the manuscript, the, the Hagia Sophia manuscript. Sure. He actually sent me the he copy of it, of the scanned him. copy of it. So, you know, I, I fully acknowledge his help in, in all of this. And um, because they had only recently published that, you know, that poetic rendition by Jamal Atala, I saw it that they, I wrote his office. I said, look, if you have access to this manuscript, can I please have a copy? Because I have been trying, you right. know, uh, through my own facility to get it from the Turks and they're not giving it out. And he yeah. did immediately. He got his secretary to you know scan the, the, the manuscript, and they sent it out to me. And that was the only uh, manuscript I had. And other than Corbin's French, there was nothing else mm -hmm. until probably around 2013, 2014. My friend at the Digital Occult Manuscripts Library found the Ragged Pasha manuscript, which is the oldest manuscript of the complete works of Sohoardi that we have. Uh, it's not the oldest manuscript, manuscript of a Sohrawardi work. The oldest would be the Hagia Sophia Waradat manuscript. Right. This is the oldest manuscript of the compiled works of Sohrawardi. Then uh, a few yeah, years yeah. after that, um, even though I had friends of mine who were trying to get these three or rather four manuscripts from the Topkapi library, right. uh, finally right. a friend, uh, you know, here in Australia, a scholar, uh, managed to get their hands on these four manuscripts for me. So then it's we really had really hard to get things out of the top copy in my experience. I oh, mean, uh, others, you yeah. know, because now everything is either 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 in the Suleimaniya Kutubhanase or the um the Bayezid and they've been pretty you know I've done work there on Ibn al Arabi and other things and I've never really had any problems. But Topkapi Sarai is is another matter. 
and um, a lot of people also don't know that there's other than those you know everything actually didn't make it into the Suleimani yeah, there's stuff all over the place and it all depends and, and sometimes it, it depends I mean you might go one year go back a couple of years later and maybe the admin people have changed and you just never know it's it's <clears throat> that actually did happen to me once on, on one occasion with, in connection with some Buni manuscripts. But anyway, that's another topic. So you're very fortunate that you were able to get those. Finally, I mean, but there apparently are other manuscripts. There, there is um, manuscripts in Iran. For example, there is this uh, one lithograph edition um, of Mulla Sadra's Ta'liqat, al-Hikmat al that has the, the prayers in the margins of the text. Yeah. Um, you know who has that? <laughs> yes, our friend. Yeah. Our friend says he, Sajad Rizvi, yes. and he, he scanned a page and sent it to you, which you had up on your yes, blog. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He's actually agreed to let me photocopy that, but we've never gotten the chance to do it. And now with COVID and all that, last time I was in the UK, I was just there just before all of this COVID business began, almost almost exactly a year ago. So um, is, this cop is this copy a photocopy, or is it the, the original lithograph? No, no, my understanding is he's got an original litho. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so that's very interesting. Um, so my question is then, has any kind of a proper critical edition on the basis of all of these or any manuscripts of these theurgic texts of Shahab Din Surah al come out in Iran as part of the complete works? Mr. Muhammad Maliki, um, a Suhrawardi scholar who's also attached to one of the, um, one of the seminaries in, in one of the houses in yeah, Rome. Yeah. Um, he began a project called the Hikmat al Ishraqiyya back in, the first I heard of it was back in 2011. And I started corresponding with him. He then published a book called Niyayesh uh, Fatsitayesh. He promised to send me a copy. He never did. Our friend Habib sent me a copy of it finally. Okay. Um, but um, he, I think he didn't really go past one or two or three volumes of it. I've heard different stories. One individual said that they actually finished the project, but in limited edition. And that, um, mm -hmm. um, so this was like 14 volumes <clears throat> of critical text. But yeah. I've never been clear as to whether, you know, these texts of the prayers were included within it. Because when I spoke to uh, Mr. Maliki, I, he, he got the manuscript, Daya Sophia manuscript from me. Okay, so, so you got in touch with uh, Agai Maliki, yeah. Yeah, he got the, the Ayat Sophia manuscript from me, and then whether he managed to obtain any of the Topkapi or the Ragi Pasha manuscripts, I don't know. I see, I see. All right, so I think then, then there's work to be done. <laughs> there's a lot of work to there's be done. A lot of work Although, to... you know, to, 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 give, to give credit where credit is, right, there yeah. is this, there was a dissertation that, that came out in 2019 by a Polish gentleman by the name of Lukasz Piatak. I guess that's how you pronounce his first name, Lukasz. Uh, uh, I don't know, yeah. This, this gentleman contacted me um, on his own behest in 2014 um, because I was putting out stuff on my Academia PDU page, um, basically fishing, trying to find out if I had yeah. uh, other all of the manuscripts. And, at the time, I you know only had the Hagia Sophia. I mean, a few months later, yeah, uh, I I managed to get the Ragged Pasha manuscript as well. Yeah. Uh, once he was satisfied that there was no one else with all of the manuscripts, he felt secure enough in his project, and then uh, put out a dissertation that came out in, in 2019. I actually have it right here, in front of me. Oh yeah. Uh, entitled entitled uh, Between Philosophy, Mysticism, and Magic. Uh, a critical edition of the occult writings uh, of and attributed to Shahabuddin Okay, um, so this is in English. This is in English, a not a well-written English. The Arabic texts are, are, however valuable, he has managed to do a critical text with um, right. uh, this, all of the this, major this manuscripts. This was defended uh, where, excuse me? This was defended at the University of Warsaw in 2018. Okay, that's very recent. And his uh, his uh, advisor was one uh, woman by the name of Katarnina Pachniak. I think that's how she pronounces yeah, her first yeah, name. Good, right. Yeah. So we do have these now, and I've noticed that people like uh, 
Matt Melvin Kushki, um, mm -hmm. and also uh, Jamal Elias have actually uh, cited this dissertation in recent stuff that they have been putting out. I see. So, but um, the thing is that certain sections of this dissertation um, is basically arguing my points of departure in several things that I have published, but oh. without giving any attribution. Um, for example, you know, I put a text up of uh, uh, the Arba'un Asma al the the Idrisi prayer of the 40 yeah. days, yeah. Um, where in the introduction I basically argued that this um, this particular piece is no is no way can it be attributed to Shalvadin Sarawardi because there is a much older pedigree that we find, especially from Shiite texts, uh, showing that it, it actually may have originated in Imami sources. Um, and that it's even been attributed to the Imams, uh, if not to Hassan al-Basri, you know, who predates Sohruwadi, obviously. Mm -hmm. So um, this, you know, I actually, in my piece, I mentioned all the text and, and the genealogy, the possible genealogy of this particular prayer. Um, I actually had inform, informed Piatak in 2000, and early 2015, about that he should check the Bihar al -Adwar, um in the section where Ibn Talmus's Mahajan Dawat is, is, is is contained uh, yeah. to look at this argument and so then trace the, the it's not of this particular prayer yes and um, the way to do it. he never he he never acknowledged me for that and he also never acknowledged me for the fact that i put um, uh the first critical edition of the longer prayer to all of the souls and intelligences etc before he did um even though i sent a copy of it to him at the time so you know i mean this wasn't a competition i even told him at the time that you know if he was interested um, you know, that I was happy to, you know, help him with the English of this thing. If you wanted to do yeah. translations, you know, I was happy to do that. Then maybe sometime in the future we could collaborate and put a, a, an addition together. But, you know, he wanted to get to the finish line first, as it were. And then when I asked him why he didn't cite me, his, um, uh, his response to me, well, you know, your work is not official, whatever that means, even though it's been on academia so for you, so a couple you of years. Re basically went out of your way very much out of your way to help this guy whom you've never met. Yeah. And he takes your work. I'm not going to say he steals it, but he uses, you know, your work and your help and benefits from it. He doesn't acknowledge you anywhere. Now this is a... It's bad form. He contacted me, by the way, like I said, he contacted me himself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this raises a lot of questions about what exactly is scholarship and who is a scholar and, and what being official and non and or unofficial even means. Um, you know, one, one, one wonders, you know, uh, especially about a lot of these um, manuscripts, for example, which are there outside of the Islamic world. And one could argue, well, you know, if the Brits hadn't stolen them, which in many mm -hmm. cases, what, what they did, or maybe they bought them, I don't know, but there's, there's a lot of them that maybe they wouldn't have survived. Who knows? But the fact is that a lot of those, those are, ju those are just completely displaced. They're out of their context. And then they're locked away. And, uh, you know, there's, there's all these gatekeepers in terms of who can see them, who can't see them, and so forth. But this whole question of, you know, who really, I mean, do you really have to have a PhD? Uh, in the subject. I mean, you know, there's this, there's this dubious thing called peer review, right? Oh, God. Yeah. So now, let's say you want to write something about Mullah Sadra. Let's just take, or let's take Suhrawardi for an example. Who in the world right now, in the Western world, really, if we really are honest about it, is in a position to peer review something on Mullah Sadra? Uh, is there no, really anybody no, in the no, Western no, Academy no. who has read Mullah Sadra cover to cover and knows it better than let's say Ayatollah Hassan Hassan Zade Amri, or knows it better no. than who's still alive, I, right? Yes. Still alive. Who no. or who knows it better than Sayyid Jalaluddin Ashtiani, for Ashtiani example, Rahmatullah, yeah. Rahmatullah, or Sheikh Muhammad Rida Al Mudaffar. You know, I I really you know find all of this. Or even Kamal Al Haydari. You know, even I would say even Kamal Al Haydari. Really, I mean, it's 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 it really boggles the mind. It does bother me. I mean, I've, I've experienced this myself, not on one occasion, on multiple occasions where, you know, as you mentioned, you know, I, I also work on the history of the, of the Bayanis, the Azali Babis. The Azali, and, yeah, yeah. and I've sent, you know, some translations and analysis. One particular article I sent to the Vyat Islam, 
uh, in 2017, uh, entitled The Organization of Hierarchy of the Babis in the Period of Sofazal's uh, Residency in Baghdad, which basically through even the evidence of Baha'i text itself uh, yeah. demonstrates that the Baha'i position on, on early Babi history is completely complete whitewash. And it got rejected and it got sent to these Baha'i peer reviewers, mm. uh, two of whom I actually later identified who they were. <clears throat> and they managed to convince this editor in chief with completely sectarian and, and ad hominem arguments to reject uh, publication. Mm. And this has happened to me again and again and again and again. Even the content is good. Doesn't matter. So, I, I, the academy it, is politicized. It's completely yeah, politicized. politicized yeah. Who gets to represent what is more important than what is represented? Yes. Um, <clears throat> and you know, there's also, you know, I preferred in my own podcast to the, the writings of um, this, in my opinion, very important social theorist by the name of Charles Mills, who wrote a very influential book in the late 90s called The Racial Contract, where he uh -huh. basically rips apart the whole notion of Rousseau's social contract vis-a-vis -vis the experience of colonialism and imperialism basically says that where the West is concerned, we're dealing with a racial contract, not a social contract. contract. Yeah. And th but I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but this is a very important book. But, and this is, but this has been my experience where, you know, the bulk of academia in disciplines such as Islamic studies, et cetera, um, are either white um, or Uncle Tom's, you know, so you have to be one or the other. <laughs> and if you hold an independent line, if you, you know, assert the integrity of this material too, too much, uh, you get sidelined and blacklisted by, by, by the system. It doesn't matter whether you have a PhD or not. So in my opinion, you know, even though I started on the whole PhD route, um, because of the politics I experienced in the academy in the ivory tower, of, you know, at the yeah. time of the 90s, I decided that, you know, I just didn't want to deal with this sort of thing because it meant that you had to sell out your own integrity in the process. You became basically part of, of, of this bazaar of, of Western capitalism. Yeah, you wrote something on that. Did you, uh, that's on your. Yeah, own? I did. Yeah. Uh, why? Why I'm not a PhD? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting document, but <clears throat> I haven't read this book called The Racial Contract. But I, I do think, for example, in the case of Islamic philosophy, Islamic philosophy is is <clears throat> not really taught as philosophy. It's taught as history, mm -hmm. or as some sort of yeah. antiquarian, or you know, some bizarre Talmudic exegesis or something. <laughs> It's, it's never really presented as, as philosophy that you can take seriously as philosophy. And but I think that's true of other philosophies as well. Other, if we want to talk about, let's say, world philosophy, I think that's also true of, of Chinese philosophy, for example, or Indic uh, philosophy. And in fact, there's, there's an interesting book. I think I've got it here. It's called Taking Back Philosophy, a Multicultural Manifesto by Brian W. Van Norden. Mm, yeah. And there's a uh, <clears throat> forward by J.L. Garfield. J.L. Garfield, you know, Van Norden is an is, um, expert in, in classical Chinese uh, philosophy and language. And Garfield is a specialist in Buddhist, especially, I think, Tibetan Buddhist philosophy. And I think they had written some sort of an op ed piece in some online incarnation of the New York Times, in which they were talking about how it's important to look at world philosophy. And there was a massive uh, negative reaction to that. And then you know, they wrote this book, which, which I just got, and I'm, I'm going through it. But <clears throat> it's certainly true that, you know, if, if, you, if you can even find a course on Ibn Sina, it's not Ibn Sina's philosophy or Ibn Sina as a philosopher. It's maybe everything else or everything but. Yeah. And it's almost the last thing in the world that would occur to, to that kind of a mindset that maybe we should pay attention to what this man had to say. And maybe he has something to say to us and to our particular historical moment. Instead, it's all, sort, all sorts of obscure manuscript studies. And I think manuscript studies are important, but you know, that's what you sort of find with, in terms of Ibn Sina with the Gutis crowd. Yes. And, and the people yeah. who studied with Gutis, I think it was Riesman who did this ex overly erudite work on uh, these uh, treatises of, uh, <laughs> of Ibn Sina. But that's what you find. And um, I, honestly, I still think that when it comes to someone like Mullah Sadr, for example, to this day, really the only comprehensive study uh, of Ibn Sina, uh, sorry, of, of Mullah Sadra in English that's actually worth really reading is still Fazl Rahman because he actually sat down in his office 
in the University of Chicago Oriental Institute, read through all nine volumes, was an expert on Ibn Sina, and he actually understood what he was writing. Um, you know, I mean, so. I, I also like Christian John Bay's The Acts of Being. I thought that The Act of Being, that was not a bad book, I thought. Um, as, a, as a, I mean, it, 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 it has its gaps and problems, but it, I, I didn't think it was a bad book overall. I don't know if uh, I'm not. I'm not as convinced on uh, on Jembe. I don't think it was as successful. I do think that Fazl Rahman at least gives you a, a complete overview of the whole system, and you know Jembe, I'm, 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 we'll have to agree to disagree. I think uh, in terms of of uh, just dealing with Tashkik al Wujud, you know, such others mm. is uh, an important work in the field, but it's addressed. At, you know, he really tries to take it serious as philosophy, but it's it's written very much to and the analytic philosophy crowd. And so yeah. if you're not well versed in that, it's a very uh, difficult read. Um, but I think it does, it does a good job of at least making it presentable as philosophy to that to the analytic crowd. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, those that was not our, our topic. We're supposed to be so hard to Well, I mean, this is all, this is all perfect. Yeah. Well, so, know, is... so, but you, but yeah, so you don't have any serious study of, of Suhrawardi either. I no, mean, not really. In the case of Mullah Sadra, you've got, you know, these different books. You've got a lot of people interested in Avicenna or Ibn Nazina, but you don't really have an interest in Suhrawardi. Now, to what would you attribute that? Why do you think that is? Well, because, look, um, one of the conversations I had with Hossein Ziai in his, in his office was particularly about that, is that he was, he was saying that, in, you know, we need to make these figures more respectable and palatable to the yeah. philosophy crowd of philosophy departments in Western universities. And so, you know, that it behooved people after him who came working on Islamic philosophy to be able to craft and, and make Sohrabardi palatable to, to you know, the, the, the people in the philosophy department at UCLA. But the fact of the matter is that most of those, that crowd, which in my opinion are not real philosophers, um, the only serious philosopher that they would consider would be Immanuel Kant. I mean, even continental philosophy to this crowd is not really philosophy, let alone, you know, philosophy coming from, from the Islamic world or, or the East or anywhere else. Now, yeah. you, ref, you referenced that book about, um, that book that you showed before. Uh, taking about reclaiming, back philosophy, yeah, this one. Taking, yeah. taking back philosophy. Hamid Dabashi had a very interesting back and forth uh, uh, shouting match with Slavoj Zizek. Where and he published this in a book called uh, "Can Non-Europeans Think?" Um, yeah, that was uh, what back in 2014. Yeah, 2014. That, yeah, I mean, I that, that. at least at, at least what is being presented in this discussion is ex extremely important for other people to look at because what it lays bare is that within these Western institutions of higher learning, and particularly in uh, these disciplines that you have. Um, that they're not going to take any of this seriously because there's already a biased assumption yeah. um, that the reason why we have these disciplines is basically to gather knowledge, gather information about the mechanics of various cultures. So in other words, the ivory tower in the West is basically an extension of um, imperialism. Mm. You know, so, and this is why people like, for example, Henry Giraud are now referring to the um, military industrial surveillance media academic complex. complex yeah gosh as a mouthful but yeah that's quite a mouth yeah, yeah but it does cover uh yeah the whole range i guess so they're, they're not looking at us in the east as as even existential equals mm -hmm. you understand um and that's why they don't accord um you know islamic philosophy that you know what you know the kind of platform that it deserves the kind of study it deserves. Now, what I find interesting, you know, going back to Solo ID, right. is that this dissertation by Lukas Piata um, breaks the mold, and it breaks the mold from this angle. Lukas Piata, from my understanding, is a crony of, of John Walbridge. And in fact, it was John Walbridge, according to Piata himself, that first sent him uh, the manuscripts of, of, of Solo ID's works that had the water that it in, at the very beginning of the dissertation, he actually claims that, that you know, he was inspired to, to do this research because of uh, Walbridge's article uh, that was published in Ishra, the one that we referred to before. Uh -huh. But what the Piatek has effectively done with this dissertation mm. um, is basically proven, uh, you know, uh, 
proven Walbridge's entire thesis about Sahuardi to be quite shallow, indeed. Oh. Um, he's been forced, you know, to, you know, you know, go back to Corban and then follow the trails to the Mazdian text, to the Proclean text, um, and so on and so forth. And so Sohuardi, the theurgist, is back, basically, yeah. with this dissertation. Well, it'll be interesting to see if he, if he publishes it. Um, but I would like to just rewind a little bit and maybe disagree with you a, a bit on, on, on what you said about uh, what was that whole mouthful, the military industrial? Mil military what? industrial uh, surveillance okay. media academic complex. Uh, okay, I, Henry, Gero, I, Henry Gerosto. Henry Gerosto. Henry Gerosto. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that in many instances that, that acad academia has been and is a, and can be an extension of, of, of empire. But at the same time, I think there might be some simpler answers, and it's not one or the other, but it's it's a convergence of these two. I would argue. Let's say a young person wants to study Islamic philosophy. Where are they going to mm -hmm. go, and who are they going to study it with? A, a young person in the West. Mm -hmm. Let's say from a non-Muslim background. Some Muslims have a head start because you know they learn to read the Quran, so that that's something, right? Okay. So let's. So this guy, this person, has got to go and learn Arabic. He's got to learn Persian. He's got to learn these languages. That's hard enough. And then once you've been through this whole philological <clears throat> education, um, and and that's that's already saying a lot. You know, if getting into one of those universities where there's not a lot of places where that's offered. Who's teaching these courses? You know, no, where, as where, of, where are you going to as, learn it? Well, and, as of right and, now, and let's say let's say you 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 and it's a huge learning curve. Let's say you get beyond the language learning curve, and mm -hmm. you pick up hikmatul ishraq, or you pick up al isharat with tanbihat, or if you pick up any of the classic Islamic philosophy texts, then there's a whole other linguistic hurdle there because these terms are used in a certain way. Do you think that you know um, that uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry, whoever they might be in these universities, how many people actually know what those terms mean? Very few. Right. Very few. So there's all yeah. these learning curves. And then let's say you somehow even get to that. You have to have, if you want to understand Ibn Sina, you have to have a good understanding of Aristotle. Who takes Aristotle seriously nowadays in, in, in Western philosophy? You know, let's Nobody. Say if you, if Nobody. Supposedly you're educated. You know, most people who are into philosophy, let's say, they, you know, if you've read a little bit of Nietzsche and you've read Heidegger and I don't know, Wittgenstein, that doesn't prepare you to read Mullah Sattar, does it? No. So there are all sorts of other hurdles, even if this whole imperial, this whole empire discourse or dimension wasn't there. But so the question, but the question still remains: Is yeah. knowledge production in Western universities a sort of taxonomizing industry of Western imperialism, where, yeah, you know, they get people to jump through all these hoops and hurdles, and whoever comes out the other end with the PhD, you know. Uh, gets the prize. I don't maybe. even know what, what this phrase knowledge production means. A lot of people use it, but knowledge isn't produced. It's not an industrial no, process. In, it's uh, but yeah, we know, we know that. But, it, but yeah, but in the West, in, and in the capital, in, under capitalism, under neoliberal capitalism, sure. right? Everything is a product, right? This uh, is so and, unfortunate. It, it's not. Yeah, this it is, is extremely unfortunate. I'm not saying this is a good thing at all. You're talking so, about the commodification of everything, the monetization. The commodification of, of knowledge, especially with the, with the Western Ivory Tower. And so area disciplines, right, being responsible for their particular area are producing the product. Mm -hmm. And hence, we have a knowledge production. Um, okay. and if that's what that means, I, if no one's ever yeah. really explained that to me, thank yeah. you. That's, that's basically what it means. Yeah. So... And which is then specific to these various area disciplines and with obvious gatekeepers at every door, side door, <laughs> what have you. Um, and as we know, money sets the agenda and universities um, not only raise money from the public purse, but nowadays everywhere in the West, uh, private foundations and interested foundations, whatnot, yes. also funding projects. I didn't know this until, for example, recently that um, you know, one of the ways that these journals with open access are getting around this whole thing is that they're making a lot of authors pay for their own publications, even though the research that is being published in these open access journals is, is being funded by, by the public purse. That, that blew me away when I found that out, you know. Well, no, I think you do have a very, that's a very important point. I mean, 
why is it's very different now in the modern world. I mean, when Nasir al-Din Atusi wrote his commentary on al-Isharat with Tanbihat, he wasn't trying to make a buck. Mm. And he wasn't trying to get tenure. And he wasn't trying to impress his colleagues. And uh, I don't even think the book would have circulated widely because Ibn Sina makes it very clear in the Isharat. He says, you know, don't share this book of mine with, you know, this writing of mine with, with people who are unworthy. And so the whole notion of, of knowledge and writing books was, was quite different than it is today because people are writing it to make a buck or the publisher is trying to, and they're trying, and they're doing it in academia at least to get tenure, uh, to get, uh, to go from assistant to associate or from lecturer to reader or to professor, um, uh, you know, to impress their colleagues, to pursue, pursue this whole path of careerism. And there's very few people there who are really, um, uh, you know, fulfilling the, the teaching of Imam Ali alayhi salam when he said that, that the seeking of knowledge is more obligatory upon you than the seeking of wealth. Uh, you know, how many people actually go to university because they really want to know? Very, very, very few. And so, you know, well, you and I were amongst that crowd. We really wanted to know. You know I think we're, we're very yeah. much in the minority and we mustn't yeah. forget that in the age in which we live and, and it, it is what it is. A look around. Um, but anyway, so coming to the question of books, when Suhar Wardi wrote Hikmat al-Ishraq, there's, there's an interesting passage, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, and I want to just call um, attention to it. So, well, there's actually two passages, but let's, let's go with, with, uh, with uh, the one at the end first. There's one that I, that I like very much at the beginning, I think it's at the beginning. This one actually might be, well, the one at the end that I have in mind is that when he's completed the book, he says in Arabic, right? Right? It's very, very interesting. So what he's basically saying is that when he's completed the book, there is a particular uh, planetary configuration. And I think I worked with the passage years ago. Find the passage. Yeah, it's, it's on page 290 of the Korban uh, edition, volume two. This is at the end of the book here. It should be at the um, end of the book. I don't know why at the top of the heading it says Qissat al Ghurbat al Gharbiya. Oh. oh no, it's it is in the sorry, it is in the Qissat. I read the wrong passage. <laughs> I read this is, yeah. the passage in Qissat al Ghurbat al Gharbiya as well. This is the it translation was, from Walbridge and Ziyayab, the passage that Nizam just read. Well, in Hikmat al-Ishraq, I'm sorry, it's on two, page 258. He yeah. says, yeah. I, I am sorry. So he he says comes, I exhort you, I exhort you to preserve this book to keep it safe and guard it from those unworthy of it. God is my successor ruling over you. I yeah. completed its composition on the last day of the month of Jamaat al akhirah of the right, year right. 582. 582. On the day the seven planets were in the sign of Libra uh, at the end of daylight. Exactly. Uh, so Give it uh, only to one worst in the methods of the peripatetics, a lover of the light of God. Let him meditate for 40 days. 40 days, abs exactly. Abstaining from meat, taking little food, Concentrating upon the contemplation of the light of God, most mighty and glorious, and upon that which He holds the authority to teach the book shall command. The Qayyim al Right, the Qayyim al Kitab. So there's two yeah. things here, and I'm sorry I just turned to the wrong because I had two passages marked here and I, I turned to the wrong one. So the, this at the end of Hikmat al Ishraq, which is again 582 of the Hijra, when the planets are aligned in Libra. So I worked this out some years back that this should correspond to the 16th of September, 1186, at 1727 and 45 seconds Aleppo time. Mm. So five in the afternoon. Yeah, 5 p.m., five in the afternoon. 
Now, it's very interesting that these seven planets were all aligned in the constellation of Libra. And then in the Waridat and Taqdisat, he's got these, these invocations addressed to the seven planets. So what I'd like to ask you is, you know, how do you understand, what is your understanding of Suhra Wardi's understanding of planetary intelligences? That's one, or angels. Mm -hmm. Because there is this notion in ancient philosophy, going all the way back to Aristotle, mm -hmm. of, um, uh, what do you call them? Al-Uqul al mufaraqa in English. Um, yeah. Non-corporeal yeah. intelligence. Non-corporeal intelligence, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. it, it has some relationship with his, his, his proof for the existence of God as being the unmoved mover, but people yeah. confuse that. It's not really unmoved. It's, you know, it, it means it means the one who's not subject to change, who who is who is not a division into act and potency. Mm -hmm. And you have the heavens. Well, they move. Motus is change, and motus would in, in in the Latin of the Scholastics. I'm not sure what he said in Greek. And so the only kind of change that the uh, planetary planets and the planetary spheres are subject to is change. Is, is motion. motion. Otherwise, they aren't subject to corruption. And the only way you can explain this motion is if that each planet itself has its own unmoved mover, and it's a disembodied intelligence. And so, you know, some people have the idea that an angel is somehow dragging or pulling or <laughs> the planet, um, or is it, or is the planet itself a sentient being? Um, you know, so how do, how do you understand this? And how does Sohra Wadi understand that? That's my one first question. It's a big question. And the second question, this whole idea about fasting and, uh, you know, that this book is not written for all and sundry and that, you know, it can really be only be had from the Qayyim al-Kitab. So what do you understand mm. by the Qayyim al-Kitab? That's a great question. I've, yeah. I've been well, contemplating both of these questions. The <laughs> first question is actually straightforward. Um, the uh -huh. literal physical planets are not the angels. They are the theurgies of the entities the Ar uh, Arbab, no, the, the lords of the species. So that the planets are the theurgies of these lords of the species, as it were. What does it right? mean? Right? Because just remember, in the, in sorry, what does it mean when you say that a planet is a theurgy? It's the, it, it, or, 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 or let me put it another way. It's that the planet is a sort of, is, is a kind of entelechy of the, of the, of the spirits. It's an entelechy, of the, entelechy or entelechy, yeah. Yeah, yeah of, of the spirit behind it that moves it, as it were. Um, because, you know, so, so are these notions of angelology. It's not that there's angels out there. There's nothing, you don't find the angels out there, right? It's in the inner world where the, where the reality, the instantiation of the angels are, are yeah. known. So, you know, the material world being a sort of a, uh, I use the, the word, Plotinus uses tolma of the spiritual world, of the suke, right? These angels, or the angelologies, mm. the, the archetypes of them are the animates that, that animate the, 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 the actual physical planets. So they're the well, signatara. You use the word entelechy, and that, that's a word with a huge history. Yeah, right? I know. So, so I use that very hesitatingly, yeah. All right, well, I mean, do you use it in the same sense as Aristotle, or are you using it in the same sense as, as the Muslim peripatetics? I'm using it in the same sense as the Muslim peripatetics, but even then one has to be careful because what Suhrawadi means by it is, is, is much more refined. Because Just remember, peripatetics, with the exception maybe of Ibn Rush, never used the word antalashia. Yeah. They, yeah. They, 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 they used it with reference to the soul. Yes. And they would say that it's the first perfection, kamalun awwalin, et etc. et cetera. Yeah. It's the first perfection of an organic body. Just remember that, that, that we're... This organon is concerned on the definition. So why do you rejects real definition? He throws yeah. that out, right? Because it acknowledges by presence. So El Mahudri by definition. So these these definitions, real definitions that the parabatal logic deals with are not, you know, are rejected by So Right. So the planet it, it, it is something that way, let's put it this way. The planet is this, the material symbolization of the of the of the angelic intelligence. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But so we can you know, pray to it insofar as it is the symbol of the, of the, of the being, of the intellectual being. Of the okay, when you say pray, design. what would be the word in Arabic? Because he doesn't yusalli ala or yeah, yeah. what does he do? Dua, he da'a, he calls. He da'a yad'u, he invokes. Invokes it, yeah. Supplication, right, okay. Supplication, yeah. Um, 
So this is the way that Sohuad kind of understands this. It has a sort of quasi-pagan resonance to it. It sure does. You know? Yeah, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but by the same time, perhaps this is one of the reasons they had a problem with it. Yeah, but you also have to go into Sohuwadi sources um, because these various lords of the species, which are angels, right? Yeah, in the Zoroastrian worldview that that Sohuwadi is very much incorporating into all of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not just the planets, the not necessarily the planets, but the elements all have lords of the species. So you have the Lord of the species of fire, of earth, of water, mm -hmm. etc. And what Suhawadi is doing is basically looking at these planets as a sort of Lord of species in, on, the, on the horizontal level of, of emanation, um, because the, the longitudinal level of emanation leads into the, to, to the other world, the world of the Malekul. Uh, this is the, the sphere beyond the fixed stars, um, yeah. etc. So these are, the, in, in essence, the planets of the material signatara of the higher intelligences. Signatara? So we're not localized. They're signatures. Uh -huh, uh -huh, oh, right. You know, we're yeah. not localized. The intelligence are not localized, but their symbols represent the planets, if you will. All right. So I have this very important work for Sohrawardi studies. فرهنگ اصطلاحات آثار شیخ اشراق شهاب yeah. سهروردی و سید محمد خالد قفاری I don't know what you think of this book It's very good But he, he is equating under the heading رب النوع So Lord of the Species He puts in parenthesis parentheses ارباب اسنام Yes so are the, are, is the, is the Rabb, um, Sanam or Arbab Asnam in the plural form, the Lord of the, what would you call that? The Lord of the... Of the idol. I mean, Sanam means idol. Of the, the idol. Lord, the of the, of the icon. Yeah. I don't know. Of the icons, yeah. What would you... Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure how we would render that. And I'm sure Korban would have a really cool way of doing it. But... Well, he would call it the, the, the master of the iconophony. Iconophony. <laughs> right. So how do you... So is there a difference? Are they the same? The Rabbu Sanam then is the same as the as the Rabbu Noah. The Rabbu Sanam is is basically the, these are the 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 Arbaba Astam or the lower level Arbaba No. So the the of the elements, particularly the materialized elements. Okay, but is that different from Saha uh, Sanam? If you say, use the Persian form, Sahab Sanam. Sahab Sanam would be the singular. Well, no, there's Sahab and then there's Rab. Well, this is the difficulty in Sohrawardi is, is that the, the same difference because between I, Sahib and Rab are, are, are kind of same, synonymous. Right? Yeah. Because here he says, Sahib uh, Sanam Haman Rabbun Noast. So the Sahib Sanam is the, exactly the same as Rabbun No. So he uses them, use them interchangeably. Interchangeably, yeah. You're very confusing. Yeah. You, 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 do, you get a lot of that in, in the Kibbutz Al-Ishraq. This is why from commentator to commentator, there are such, sometimes some very radical takes yeah. on these various passages. Yeah. I personally like the commentary of Shahrazuri the best uh -huh. um, on the Ikhmat, it's the first, but uh, um, I think Shahrazuri's commentary is more keeping with the spirit of Sohoaydi himself than say Qutbuddin Shirazi's or um, even Jalal Dabani, although Jalal Dabani did the co commentary on the Heikel um, yeah. but that early commentary, that first commentary of the Ikhmat al is probably closer, in my opinion, to, to what Suharwadi's so intentions. What direction uh, do you think that Qutbuddin Shirazi takes it in, which isn't as... He over-rationalized it. Over he, you know, he really over-rationalizes Suharwadi. Yeah, I got yeah. that impression as well. Yeah. Maybe that's why I think that one is more readable. <laughs> I don't know. It's and he also a, argues a lot with Suharwadi. He has a lot of arguments with Suhuad, you know, in these yeah. comments that he puts on these various passages. It's actually quite, quite humorous in certain, I mean, it's very dense commentary, but it also gets very funny in certain places where he disagrees and, and right. you know, yeah. Well, coming back then to this whole idea about the planets. So why for Suhuad is it important to have invocations of these planets? Why is this part of his theurgy? And obviously, it's a really big deal that they were all lined up in Libra when he finishes the books. It's like they're all in one place, uh, at least in terms of zodiacal longitude. <laughs> obviously, they can't all be on top of one another. 
but. because um, the schema of, of Sohoyadian metaphysics is hierarchical, mm -hmm. right? There is not a direct line between, for example, humanity and the Godhead, the Nural Anwar, the lights of lights. The light there, of light. there are stages of intermediaries. Mm -hmm. And the planets then represent, you know, um, uh, you know, symbolically represent these seven stages leading up to the God of Gods, the Ilah al Anha, the Nur al Anwar. Yeah, so how do you explain a term like the God of Gods in an Islamic context? Yeah, <laughs> this is a very pagan, I mean, I, yeah, I, I pointed this out. Before. You do find um, uh, phrases yeah. which I think many, many Muslims would kind of stop and, and, and look at it, look yeah. at it and wonder what's going on here. And yeah, not just yeah. Muslims now, but I think Muslims in his time as well, which which is maybe sure. maybe why he had some problems. I mean, I don't know how these things were, if these were widely disseminated. I mean, we can discuss, you know, what really led up to his execution later. But but on this point, how do you explain a term like ilahul aliha? Well, first of all, there is a already existing pedagogy. You will find this term in Ibn Wahshia in the Nabataean agriculture. So, um, and I've actually run into it in all kinds of occult texts that are not Suhawardian at all, the God of Gods. Mm -hmm. For Suhawardi, right, each uh, level above represents a Lord. The, the Lord of each level above the one that we're in is, is, is also in a sense a God to the one below it because it is transmitting uh, the energies and the lights and the emanations from the, the, you know, the levels above it, which lead to the Godhead. Right? Yeah, so this Allah, is like Allah. the notion of a kind of chain uh, chain of being. Yes. And I had this discussion with uh, with our mutual friend Habib uh, Shahbazi as well, um, and he's he mentioned that this goes back to Proclus when I was talking. Yes. About. And he's right. if you refer to this work on Proclus, mm. I'm not sure how you pronounce this. Radic Chlup C H L U P Proclus an intro introduction. Uh, he talks about vertical chains in uh, in chapter yeah. three. Um, Perhaps along the lines, more or less along the lines of what you're describing, um, and this whole movement of the souls as well, which is mentioned in in, in the Phaedrus myth in Plato. So, so this is a kind of, would you say, a kind of planetary theurgy, in which you kind of have an ascent of the soul through this great chain of being, and a kind of uh, reassimilation, uh, return, al mabda wal maad kind of idea, right? Origin and return to the, exactly if not, if we don't say God of God, but at least to the origin, to the principle. To the principle, yeah. But this is also a Zoroastrian thing, you know, because with the Zoroastrian cosmology, there is Or Mas, the Ahura Mazda, and then there's the Amara Spentai, the mm. seven archangels that, that emanate, that are hypostases of the, of, of the Godhead. Seven angels. Um, so are those the same seven angels which we find in Islamic the, uh, theurgical, Quranic theurgical works, like of Albuni, for example? They have been compared, you know, to that, to that, but um, but they don't have to, they, the names don't correspond, or do they? No, no, they, these are Avestan names. These are, um, let me see if I can find the names of all of these here. Uh, well, that doesn't mean that they necessarily refer to a different thing, and the same thing can go by a different no. name, right? Which is, which is what's, which is the way the Suhawardi approached all of this, right? You know, with a very high, with a very hybridized understanding, um, of what, what, uh, with what these beings represent. So how do you think Suhawardi came to this? Um, I mean, he, he claims very much, doesn't he, that what he is embodying and teaching is, is a reaffirmation of the living of the ancients, the Khamirat al-Azal, right? The, the living of, the, of, the, of pre-eternity. And, pre and in fact, he mentions people by name, ancient Greek sages and Persian sages. I don't remember the Persian sages, but for the Greeks, he mentions Agatha Daimon, for example. He mentions Empedocles, which I think is very interesting. Empedocles, yeah. In the yeah, context Hermes, of Kingsley's book. Yeah. Hermes is a prophetic figure, which was also the case for the uh, late uh, Neoplatonists of Antiquity, uh, late antiquity Neoplatonists like Proclus that you just mentioned. Sure. Um, see, he, that, he that's, my, my, that's my question. Yeah. You know, you can claim to be uh, in the line of Proclus right now if you wanted to, and it, it's not a very believable claim because that all died out. So how is it that Suhrawardi can claim when he, at that time as well, that he is really sort of the, the, the inheritor, the waris, the varis, if you like, of, of, of ancient Hellenic, you know, Hellas, 
and and Persia as well. And Egypt. <laughs> and Egypt, yeah. The Nun and Methuselah. And India. <laughs> Does he say that too? Yeah. Uh, well, the claim is based on whatever mystical experiences that, that he was having. So the claim is a species of shat, you know, these ecstatic sayings that many Sufis are well known for. Mm -hmm. um, he also claims many of these Sufis, for example, Hallaj, Bestami, to study in his Sinsula, you know, together with this, um, you know, whether mythical or, or not, lineage of priest kings that he claims, the incredibly strong, whom, whom he calls the Khosrawan Yun. Um, mm. That there was a, you know, a sort of uh, religio perennis, you know, the, I mean, Surawadi was using this concept, you know, Jovidan Khirad, long before. You know, gain on. <laughs> well, long before Hussein Nasser, that's I think. Or Hussein Nasser gain on. Likes or yeah. so much because of his own Shwanian project, but that's another discussion. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, does he actually use the word Javidan Khirad? I mean, the word yeah, out yes. there, yeah. you know, in Miskawa is famous, Al Hikmatul Khalida, a famous book by Miskawa. So the word was out, the phrase was out there. Did he actually use that? Yeah. Javidan Khirad is the term that somebody uses, yeah. Is my understanding is that it was actually a pre-Islamic text. There was an actual text, a kind of ancient mirror for princes, right? That went by this name, Javidan Khirad. Yeah. So which would, which would have been certainly accessible or known about by Suhawardi in some form. It would have to have been known because, because Miskawe, when he does his, Ar it was apparently already translated in Arabic, then Miskawe gets it, incorporates it into his book, adds a bunch of wisdom sayings from the Islamic tradition and others, and then puts out this book, Al-Hikmat Al-Khalida, which I really see as a companion volume to his book on akhlaq. Um, so, you know, so definitely it was out there because he's, uh, I think, uh, um, oh yes, yes, uh, Miskwe is before him. Miskwe is a contemporary of Ibn Sina. He would be older than Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina was the younger man at the time. And and so where so where these born went around five forty nine yeah yeah eleven eleven fifty ish or so eleven eleven fifty three I think I have here yeah. so <clears throat> he was thirty eight years old when when he dies so how yeah. does he die what really is the charge is he just uh, he's charged with you know various claims are made that he's uh, allegedly claimed to be a prophet that's what's out there. And uh, he was too close to the son of Salah and he didn't like this. And then he just told him, you know, get rid of this guy. But he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't beheaded in one of those sort of dramatic forms of execution. He, he was just, he just starved to death in his house under house arrest. Is that true? Um, well, in, in, a, in a prison cell or he was killed in a prison cell. Then we don't know exactly the actual circumstances uh, of his death, but he was condemned to death by Salah himself. Uh, after the Fogaha charged him with the various things, they instance, for example, his uh, Rahim e Rotsi, the very first uh, section of the, of the Waradat wa Tahrid Sa'at, as evidence of it. Um, and these prayers to the planets, uh, and just the overall project of Suhuwadi. So they of did get out. out. They, these writings. Yeah, they did they, get out. They did it, get out. His writings, yeah, because they were quoting from it. You know, according to the author. Who would he have transmitted them to? Was it the son of Salahuddin? Was he an initiative head? Yeah. So just a patron. Of Malik Zahir Shah, yeah, he would have been, he would have uh, been transmitting these teachings, per, perhaps the text themselves to this prince. Well, so how would it, how would, how did these ulama get hold of the right? I mean, I can't imagine Malik Zahir Shah would have given them up. You know, was it a servant that stole them? Or is this just well, speculation? From what we know, Saladin um, made an ultimatum to his son. You know, either hand this guy over for trial or I will depose you myself personally. Mm. So he did, and uh, the Fogaha tried them for heresy. And um, I mean, it is unfortunate what happened to Sora, but there is credibility to the charge from the point of view of, of the Orthodox ulama. When, yeah. you read, when you read what Sohrawadi is writing, in a sense, when he claims to be reviving the wisdom of the ancient, he's making a very similar claim to the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, about reviving the Deen al-Hanif, you know. So there are resonances and echoes uh, that, that in fact, this is what was going on. And then the charge that uh, is made, which is then echoed in, in uh, Bustan al Jami, is that uh, his disciples were actually calling him Rasulullah. Really? Yes. 
Well, that would be an extraordinary thing. I mean, I, I, that, that Shah Razuri mentions this too. Yeah. Well, that that just can't be allowed, obviously. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Whatever it was, I mean, it, it, Herman Landau. Herman Landau. Imagine that he would have made such a claim. I mean, f people who who you know followers. There's all sorts of personality cults. There's cult of personality, is 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 common in history. It's that's possible, but I can't imagine so already making such. These are the charges. I mean, they're 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 mentioned by by several sources. Mm -hmm. um, you know. My reading of it is, is 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 a bit different. That he is, if anything, he was maybe claiming a station similar to uh, what the Zoroastrians understand by the concept of, of prophet, which is bakshur. And a bakshur is not necessarily a Zor, uh, you know, a, a figure of, of the level of Zarathustra, um, but he's higher than a priest. You know, he's a completely god realized. I don't know this term bakshur. This is what yeah. this is a this is a Zora Avestan term. You know, for a holy man. Yeah. Herman Landolt has a very interesting theory that he presents uh, right at the final section of his review of, of Wheeler Thaxton's uh, translation of, of Sohoadi's um, uh, uh, visionary treatise. It's called the, the Tales of Initiation, where he believes, and I think this is credible, mm -hmm. that, uh, that perhaps Sohoadi uh, was a crypto Ismaili of some description, maybe not either a Fatimid or a Nazari. Um, because a lot of the ideas in the Hikmet al uh, and even in, in some of the other books before Hikmet al um, have a closer resonance to, you know, figures like Hamidudina Kermani, Abu Yaqub, Sajistani, even Nasser al These, these, you know, uh, great medieval figures of Ismailism. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that. Yeah. And, you know, Salah Adin at the time, you know, he was, he had just deposed the Fatimids. Um, he just deposed you know, the Fatimids, yeah. And then he had the Nizaris in Sy the Syria. Yeah. Yeah. Had the Nizari Ismailis in Syria who were, you know, kind of his uh rivals. You know, you know their rivals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So you know, so Rwadi basically went there maybe got pulled in to all of this intrigue. Um Right, right. He was the he was there at the wrong time and uh, ended up getting himself killed. Well, there's no house. way, there's absolutely no way the guy is just a straight-laced Sunni, right? No, so this idea about Shi'i affiliations, whether Ismaili, what, whether what, 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 have, what sort they were, but he's definitely very much in the Shi'i camp. Is yes, there any way to make an argument that he's a Twelver? Because people claim him as, as a Twelver, but there's just no evidence explicit no. in his writings that I know of. And again, I'm not an expert on, it's not someone I've devoted a huge amount of time to. I like to read him, but I haven't found any such thing. You have, you've spent your life on this. Is there any evidence there that he's- Well, a, there's, a there, he uses the terminology, he uses botany terminology. You know, for example, he refers to the prophets as the top, the speakers, right? Yeah. This is an explicitly botany term. Uh, then, this term that shows up again and again in the Hikmat al Ishraf itself, the Qayyim al Kitab. Exactly. You know, Who is the Qayyim, and how do you how would you translate Qayyim al Kitab? Uh, the 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 keeper of the book. So is that not the Imam? Exactly. Yeah. So that's so so you you would agree that Qayyim al Kitab is, without any doubt, a reference to the Shi'i doctrine of the Imam. And which kitab? Are we talking about the kitab as in the Hikmat al Ishraq? Or are we talking about the Quran? You know, because if it's, if yeah. we're talking about the Quran, then this, the Quran and Natak is the Imam, alayhi salam. Yeah, I mean, it can't be Hikmat al Ishraq, I would say. Yeah. Qayyim al Kitab. You know, Qayyim al Kitab. Al -Kitab. I suppose you could say it's the Hikmat al Ishraq, but it doesn't really, doesn't really fit with the whole context, does it? Or maybe he was claiming, just like Halaj was, maybe he was claiming the Imamate. Perhaps. I mean, these these are things that need to be explored, and there is enough, you know, information out there that there were, uh, you know, certain accusations. Now, whether the fuqaha, the Sunni fuqaha of Aleppo, actually got it right or not, Allah Allah. But um, well, I would like uh, to offer a, 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 a hypothesis, and maybe hypothesis is, is too grand a term. Just 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 a speculation. <laughs> maybe maybe it's something akin to. Muhyiddin ibn Arabi's claim yeah. to being the seal of Khatam proximity, uh, the seal of sanctity. There's various ways to translate Khatam al-Vilaya. 
or khatam al walaya you know that's a whole other debate is, is is you know is it is it should we take it as wilaya or walaya and that's a whole discussion but maybe he was claiming something of that nature my my guess is 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 pretty much that, that is the case but perhaps uh the terminology that was being used was a little bit more explicit at times mm. uh because you know we you know throughout the history of islamic mysticism we have had these incidents of Indeed. people making yeah you know very high claims high claims yeah shat yeah. you know shat shat yeah. whatever you want to you know there's different translations of that one one translation i was just stuck in my mind was with theopathic locution yeah i've used that a few times i don't know if that was, was that carl ernst <laughs> came up with that i don't remember who that was but or, or ecstatic utterance i think is carl yeah, yeah, car, yeah. So ecstatic utterance is it's a little bit less uh yeah. grandiose but so maybe this is what's going on. I, I, I really don't know. Um, I think he's, he's an absolutely fascinating figure and there's still a tremendous yes. amount of work that needs to be done on uh, Soho uh, But now I'd like to, you know, what do you think about the resonances between the kind of theurgy that Soho is is espousing and that of Iamblichus? You know, some years ago, there was Very a very cool. interesting book on Iamblichus by Gregory Shaw. I have it, yeah. Dear and soul. and yeah. you know this whole discussion and correspondence between Iamblichus and Porphyry <clears throat> on the ancient mysteries. Because I do think, and you know, Peter Kingsley also in his very important book, uh, I just had it here. Where'd it go? Uh, what's what's the title of the book? Oh, here it is. Sorry, in magic. Yeah. Yeah. Ancient Philosophy, Mystery, and Philosophy Magic. Philosophy Against Magic, great book. Uh, Empedocles and Pythagorean Tradition. So what do you think about the similarities? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm singling out Iamblichus for a reason. Because, um, you know, um, Julian, mm -hmm. the Emperor Julian, uh, was unfortunately referred to as the apostate by Christians. He was <laughs> trying to bring back the original ancient Greek religion of, of, of this whole theurgy and theosis. And Julian has these very interesting sort of, um, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, um, yeah, invocations or prayers or supplications to the sun, right? And the sun was seen as the great noetic symbol of the principle, mm. shining up there in the sky every day, moving across the ecliptic. So Sohrawardi also has Right, an orison addressed to the sun, but he refers to the sun by an ancient name. Hurash. Hurash. Now, I don't know if that's, you're the expert on this. Is this Avestan? Is it probably, what is it? So maybe if you could address this, this fascinating uh, um, commonality. Well, the, 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 the pronunciation is actually off uh, because it, the Avestan is Kashat Nabareya you know, okay. uh, to Huraksh. But by the time it gets to Huraksh, the Sohrawardi becomes Huraksh, uh, which uh, we get the mod, also we get the modern Persian word from Derakshan, you know, which Derakshan, means, you know, Khorshid, yeah, Khorshid, et cetera. Um, this prayer, which is a prayer to the sun and it's for the day of Sunday is, um, is something, it, it, it is absolutely beautiful. You know, I've been reciting this every Sunday for years now myself. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> right. uh, you know, just to maybe be amongst the camp of, of the Ishraq Yun, as it were. Uh -huh. This this is not the only one because you also have the other six prayers for the days of the week that are, are, are very similar. And he uses these right. Avestan names, you know, which I, I mentioned uh, Mr. Walbridge got wrong when it came to Venus. He, he couldn't actually read the manuscript group. Correctly. Well, again, I mean, yeah. Iamblichus was doing this kind of thing. Julian was interested yes. in this. Obviously, the sun had an important place. They were invoking the other planets as well. Yeah. I think you see this in Thabit ibn Qurra later. Yes. So I'm just curious to how how do you see that? You know, I mean, are they doing the same thing? I mean, what's your They're doing the same. I think they're doing the same thing. I think, um, I mean, Sir White is clo closer to Proclus's view about these things than he is to Iamblichus. Because when you read the, the Mysteries of, of Iamblichus, um, you know, at least from the translations that I've read, um, it's sometimes not clear whether the Sanam is, is what exactly in, in this relationship that, that the Amblichus 
is explaining to Porphyry. Uh, 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 uh. But with, with Proclus, it's very, I mean, he, the way that he unpacks this and explains this um, is, is more in keeping with the spirit of, of, of Sorat Wadi and actually then maintains the Neoplatonic version of Tovit. Mm. You know, same with Sorat Wadi. Um, with Sorat Wadi, you know, the Godhead is, is, is the container of everything, out of which everything proceeds. Um, no, nothing is as equal. So, but nevertheless, you know, as we move down the hierarchy, you know, there, there, you know, each hierarchy has a relationship with the one below it. Mm -hmm. So the sun being the symbol of, of, you know, the way he phrases it, Nayira Azam, you know, uh, the most mighty light giver. Um, this is a, a symbol, a signature of, you know, the majesty of the Jalali yeah, nature. The mightiest God. luminary is maybe how The I'm mightiest thinking. luminary, yeah. Yeah. The most mighty light giver, yeah. Nayira Azam. Um, so, you know, physical things are, in a sense, the reminders that Dika uses that word Dika right at the beginning of the Rahim al Qudsi too. Mm -hmm. That how these, and he, right after he mentions the Nayir Azam, about how these things remind us, the elements remind us of the majesty um, of, of the Godhead. Um, so, and this is also the Zoroastrian approach to this thing, and it's also the appropriate approach to these things. Um, Proclus also has a whole litany of prayers to plants and the waters. And, That's and, right, he does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, the, and, and uh, of course, Corban was onto all of that. Yes, he was. And it's a pity he, he wasn't able to, for whatever reasons, uh, elaborate, investigate, and expound on these things at length in his magisterial style. I mean, I, I can, one of the most beautiful uh, passages, I think, in another book on another person, the creative imagination, mm -hmm. the Sufism of Ibn Arabi is is this chapter called the Prayer of the Heliotrope. Yes, it has this very long quotation <clears throat> from Proclus, and really, I mean, as it as a text from ancient the ancient Hellenic world, it really captures what Namaz is about. <laughs> what Namaz or what or you know what the, what the salah to use the Arabic word really is, so it's a pity he wasn't able to investigate those things further. But um, now on sort of what these Zoroastrian dimension, we've touched on the Greek dimension, and there's no way really to establish or prove that there's some sort of direct connection with Greece. You know, you, you talk about it's a mystical experience. He's somehow connected with these people on 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 a supernatural level. Let's say it's probably the best explanation in the case of zoroastrianism you could offer this or the ancient sages of iran you could offer the same explanation but the fact is that he is a, a, a persian he is an iranian yes. origin and zoroastrianism still was a, around when Zoroastri lived it's yes. still around now all right but yes. it was certainly around and it was available so is he you know i mean his whole name right is shahabuddin yahya ibn habash ibn amirak Mm. And so was Amirak, his grandfather, a, a Zoroastrian? You know, I mean, we have cases of Abu Hanifa's ancestors, the, you know, the famous or the infamous, depending on how you look at mm. Abu Hanifa's legal doctrines. You know, he's from a Zoroastrian background. There's many people like that. So is it the same thing for, for Soto Wadi? 100% possible. Just remember that part of Iran, uh, where that village of Soto Wadi is located. Where is Up it located until, in modern day Iran? This is in... This is in um, it's not quite near inside Azerbaijan. It's just right between um, uh, the borderlands between Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan, and Iranian Azerbaijan, where you yeah. have the village of Sohuan. Um In that volume that you have uh, of, of the uh, uh, Corban and Nas critical edition, there should be a yeah. picture in one of these volumes of the village of Sohuan. It's a mountainous kind of region. Yeah. The opening pages. Maybe in one of the other volumes, I mean, because yeah. these are the ones that have been published under the Islamic Republic, so they, they may not necessarily have all the same okay. pagination and all that. I'll have to, yeah, anyhow. But that area, we know, you know, that even until maybe about 50, 60 years ago, there was a quite active Zoroastrian communities with fire temples in that area. So we don't know for sure, but he may well have been from a Zoroastrian background, not too far back. Very possibly. And you know, if, if you wanted to educate you know, the child know, at that point. We don't know about his father. Did his father become a Muslim or, or was it his grandfather or was it before? We, we have no idea, you're saying. We have no idea. Yeah. 
And, but, you know, if they had converted to Islam and yet they wanted to educate their child, you know, they would send them just maybe somewhere like Maroghe, where, where Sohuradi went, mm -hmm. uh, to get educated. And then, you know, the child was ambitious, he was learned, um, maybe then found the company of Sufis, found a lot of resonances between the ideas and practices of the Sufis in his own Zoroastrian background. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest is, is history. It all came yeah, together history. in a philosophical project. Because I, I mean, I have, I have a distant family member who actually comes from the Ibrahimi clan. Th these are the, the hereditary, hereditary leaders of the Shaykhi school of Kirman. Oh. And she, she converted to Zoroastrianism from Islam. And, wow. you know, th just 10, 15 years ago. And she, I asked her very specifically, well, she told me she went through an initiation process with a Mobed, with the Zoroastrian priest. Mobed, yeah. The priest. And, and the practices that she described to me that they, um, uh, they put it through very much like a Sufi initiation, uh, kind of, you know, you go through the exact same process and they do something very similar to liquor using the Zoroastrian names of God. Well, yeah, maybe there's something there and with whole, the whole Persianate Sufism and uh, the Mazhab Ishq and the Qalandars and I, I don't know, this could all be connected on certain, in different ways and on different levels. I mean, the Korban cites a hadith in one of the volumes of an Islam Iranian, although, I, you know, the pedigree of this hadith is, is a little bit dubious, where the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, actually claims yeah. Zoroaster as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the Prophet of love. Uh, I see. Okay, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, fascinating. Well, just remember, at least even into the Safavid period, uh, Zarathustra was being claimed to be Abraham by <laughs> many Muslim scholars. I see. Well, that's uh, yeah, Sayyid Ahmed Alawi has a whole discussion of, of, of you know the Abraham Zarathustra connection. Well, that they were the same person. That's uh, that they were the same person. Yeah. That's very strange. Yeah. Well, be that as it may or may not be. Um, <laughs> uh, do you think there's any connection uh, between Sorwadi's planetary or theurgy or his invocation of these planetary intelligences and astrology? Is there any? Uh, oh, yeah. Really? In what ways Definitely. would you say? Uh, well, I mean, you know, if you know um, what is going on on any particular day, um, then you can, and this is implied in the water dot and also in the Hikmat al then mm -hmm. you, one can then design one's practice because they, like, they, like the Testament says, you know, you know, following the pattern of the stars, exactly when, you know, what has happened, the significance of events. Of, right. of, so um, are you supposed to do those invocations then at the appropriate planetary hour? Okay, because that's a simple matter. You just do yeah. it because it goes by the day, so you do it in the first hour. But yes. does it mean you also do it at the eighth? You follow me? <laughs> you start again, right? Or, or does he say, or you don't know? He doesn't say. He doesn't. There's just, there's nothing there. I'm, you know, just breathing I mean, into it. Are point. there people who have experimented with this? I have sort of experimented with right. this, um, yeah. but you won't you won't find other people talking about their own experiences around this stuff unless you go into the occult texts specifically. You know, just put the uh, Ishragi stuff aside. Mm -hmm. and go into the occult, the, the various occult manuscripts and find this stuff. Well, because you find in Albuni, for example, he has, uh, I forget the exact title now in Arabic, but he's got a whole thing for every day of the week, for every planetary hour. Uh, and, I mean, you could pull it off. It, it's not that you would need a lot of time. You just have to know him by heart. And so in the beginning it would be difficult. I haven't tried it, but I thought about it once, but you know, it, it's, you'd have to memorize all of these and then do them and then see how, and then see what happens. <laughs> well, you can do it with the names, the various names, you can break them down by their letters, you know, and then into the elemental and then calculate the various hours at which the, uh, the name should be invoked without even using a square. I've done that. And this is for Sohawardi. No, this is me, but you know, this is just from, yeah. Oh, for divine names. Yeah, the divine names. Yeah, oh yes, of course. Oh. This is this is yeah. this is, this is uh, how it's done. Yes, one one, yeah. one can do that. Yeah, that's understood. <laughs> okay. I was just curious. You know, I mean, if there's anybody besides your good self who is who is uh, trying to work with these uh, Sohrawardian methods, uh, because there, they must be out there. I can't believe that you know I'm I'm the only one out there that is actually practicing this. You know. Um, 
See, there because when be. you talk about practicing, I mean, it, it also all, it just does come down to transmission. Like, for example, the things that I do, uh, I have transmission for them, right? But when it comes to Sohar, what are the, what happened to the transmission? I mean, it's not even clear why in the world Qutb din Shirazi is writing this and he, this commentary, or even with Shaharazuri, you know, what's the connection to Sohrawardi after he died? Was there some sort of a ta'ifa, right? Some sort of a group, some sort of a brethren, uh, a confrères, you know, who were passing this thing on? And then Not that, that we know of. Did that so survive? The, the only conclusion is that the relationship is Tuli rather than Azi. <laughs> right, be, right. Yeah, you, can always, than, you can always do that. You, you, yeah, you, you can, can do that. You can always do that, yeah. Yeah. And um, so in the manuscripts that you've consulted, um, are they all clear enough? I mean, do you, because really what we're left with then is a process of reconstruction, aren't we? Depending on- Which the is fairly the simple. Are they, you know, simple. Are they really different? Are they in a bad state? I've only seen Hagia Sophia and I've seen the Raghav Pasha, uh, which you very graciously shared, have shared with me. I, I haven't seen the others, but are they in a good state of preservation? There's not like insane amount of variance, right? It all more or less- They're all more or less. I mean, it, it is, there are you know slight misreadings here and there from from copyists to copies very slight they're not you know too radical but you know i i use Hagia sophia as the master kit text simply because it's the oldest that that it's exists very readable uh, uh, to me anyway yeah, uh, yeah. i i find yeah. it very readable I so don't say legible i meant i meant legible yeah yeah so from them using that as the master text or the stemma as it were then then we can very easily then reconstruct it and use these other manuscripts um to reconstruct what the waradat actually is. And it's it's not a long text. One theory I have about the waradat yeah. is that it's very possible that Surawardi may have written these within the margins of his own uh, copy of the Ikbad al So that, that it wasn't necessarily a separate text. Um, uh -huh. and, and this is actually mentioned uh, in a kind of an elusive way by Shah Razuri when he actually details the works of Surawardi. Really? So okay, if this is a you know if if the Ekpad al is the is the chief you know book of of the of the uh, illuminationist tariqa, mm -hmm. of the tariqa, then the practice would be immediately um, around the actual study of the text itself. So it's like a, it's potentially then a khatima, a kind of conclusion or an addendum <clears throat> to the wisdom of. Uh, Illumination, Hakimut al Ishraq. Together with the Qasa Qurba al Qarbiya, the tale of the Occidental Exile. Yeah, that's a very, very, very beautiful text. I mean, and I wish we had time to go into that one as well, but um, I think that's a very. I remember I first read that in translation many, many years ago, and it really made a deep impression on me and resonated on a very profound level. And I really think that, you know, I hope that you will. Um, do some work on this and and you know i mean put these things together and, and it's it's reconstructable and uh, you know people whoever wants to you know try it could try it i suppose but i really think that that Suharwadi needs to be um more widely known and uh you know more people need to work on it. it's interesting um my son he's just a young you know teenager he's about to graduate from high school i told him as a, as a good introduction to islam and philosophy he should read Sayyid Hussain Nasr's Three Muslim Sages. And I know it's an old book and a lot of the stuff is out of date, but still as a popularization, I think it's very good. So you know, he spent a lot of time reading it and I made him do a book review on each chapter. And then when he was done, I said, well, so who do you like the best? Who do you think really? And he says, Suharwardi. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, you know, the whole illumination, and the, <laughs> the light, and all of that. So he was also, also very, very inspired by it. So I, I do hope that you will uh, you know, do some work, further work on this and bring these things out there, uh, widen the circle of people who, who are able to, um, you know, approach Suharwardi as really he should be approached because this whole dimension is just yeah. ridiculous how it's been covered over. And one um, maybe final question mm -hmm. I have for you, it's probably the hardest one. What are those sigils at the end of the uh, <laughs> ISFM manuscript? <laughs> they're, they're the planetary, they're supposed to be the planetary sigils. They don't look like any sigils. I mean, do they? They they come close. Yeah, they come close to to the few that you will find in in uh, the Kitab al Mustahan. 
of, of Ibn Wachia. And remember, so, I actually, mm. yeah, remember I actually asked this question of, of Walbridge when I put that review up the first time on the blog? Sorry, I don't recall, no. Yeah, but they are. When you look at the other manuscripts, you know, they're pretty close to the, to the you know, the way some of these planetary sigils are, are laid out by Ibn Wachia himself. So, all right, but then that begs the question, what did he put them there for? What are you supposed to do with them and how do they relate? To he doesn't them? say what you're supposed to do with them, but that's kind of implied that you actually, you know, are supposed to make maybe a circle, perhaps, of the sigils. I've done it mm. uh, before actually offering the prayer. So then the whole thing becomes a magical operation. Um, it becomes you know, a theurgic operation. In my yeah, it becomes, it becomes a theurgical, yeah, it becomes a theurgical yeah. operation where yeah. you begin by, by invoking the prayer to the perfect nature. Uh, that that was about a time, and oh, then you, yeah, then you stop because that that then that is the first intermediary, the first intermediary on, on this you know on this ascent to the God of Gods. Okay, begins with yourself with the with the perfect nature of yourself. Alhamdulillah, I'm glad you brought that up because I nearly forgot to ask that. That's actually even more important than the question of the sigil. So, what is this perfect nature of Tabaatam? Now, I understand that this is maybe a little bit of a sensitive topic. Because the Quran also implies, if I'm not mistaken, that this is really a reference to the guardian angel. Yes, it is. It's the Yazata, or the, the Zoroastrian term would be the Yazata that each individual has, the celestial guardian angel. Not Karim, you know, because the, the, Karim, yeah. because the Karim is, can, can be good or bad. The, the Yazata is good. It's, the, it's Karin is the, the, the Karin is the like the Jinnic twin or doppelganger yes. I talked yeah. about recently in Glitch Bottle. It's not the same as the... Yeah. The Yazata is actually a celestial doppelganger. Celestial doppelganger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So is there any relation, you know, because in astrology, horoscopic astrology, when you have the natal figure, there are different procedures and methods to determine the guardian angel by way of astrology. One of them is explained by Ibrahim ibn Azra, you know, Abraham ibn Ezra, he's got a method. There's another method which is connected with the, actually you flip around the part of fortune a certain way and you do this and, and I don't want to go into all this stuff, but uh, people who are, who are involved in astrology, they know this. So do you think that there's any connection with that or are these two different because it's never been clear to me that, that the guardian angel that you arrive at through astrology is the same as what you're arriving at through theurgy. Because in the end, you come up with a planet, right? Yeah. At the end, it's going to be a planet. It'll be some sign or degree, then you go to the, whatever rules that, and you're done. And it's one of the seven planets again. So it comes back to our very first question. You've got the planet and you've got the angel. Mm -hmm. So did Suhrawaldi see the perfect nature also as a planetary intelligence? Yeah, so the perfect nature of the planet is, 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 is the angel itself. Just like his perfect nature, you know, is, is the celestial doppelganger. So the, you know, the, the, the Khashetra Varelia of the sun, the Hurash, uh -huh. is actually the name of the perfect uh, nature of the sun, if you want. Right. So in your, this theurgy, you're, you're undergoing this kind of ascent. Yes. And so if your perfect nature turns out to be, I don't know, Venus, then that's the way you've got to go. And if somebody else um, is Mercury, then that's their, their ladder of ascent is different. Is this what you? There's the, well, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't mention that any of that specifically. I mean, the, the, I know the occult texts say this, but um, based on very brief commentary that he actually says about what the perfect nation is, that it's a that it's a, uh, a luminous entity, right? Um, that, that the experience of which only comes through riyadha, you know, yeah, through as, ascetic mortification, etc. Cases. Um, as cases. So then, then, then you know, um, does this have a name? Is, mm -hmm. is another question because usually, the, you know, these doppelgangers come with some kind of a name or a sign, at yeah. least within a cult text. But with so why do you know? Yeah. Mm. It's more so then, There's a lot in common there then. I mean, it, it, then I think it's very, very similar to the, um, um, you know, ancient Greek, Platonic, Pythagorean sort of methods that we find in the ancient world. Very much so. And, and that's that, why it is a reaffirm. It is the leaven of the ancients. Yeah, it is. It very much is. I mean, to really understand what Sorawardi is talking about, the perfect nature, that entire section of spiritual body and celestial earth where Corban really unpacks the Fravashis, 
and the Yazata, etc. That that is that explains what sort of why they meant by it. Yeah, and the, and the interesting thing I think in, in celestial uh, in, in spiritual uh, celestial body and spiritual earth is that the earth also has an angel, because yes. in in the traditional system there's that becomes an eighth angel then, right? Yes, spendarmat. Yeah. So everything has angels then. <laughs> everything has a yeah. Everything has a perfect nature. Everything has some sort of a perfect nature. Yeah. All right. So then, if we're talking about these angels, and then there's this ascent that goes all the way up, and of course, the, all the way up to the gosh, what was it? Um, the Mura um, Sanam and the and the well before you get to that and the the Rabbu Noah and then yeah. after the Rabbu Noah is what is the is the then the the Ummahat, the the world of the mothers. These are the various. They're also Arba. And then, as the, you climb the ascent, then you come to the victorial lights, right? Uh, and water is uh, And as you climb higher and higher, then you know the first intellect, which is Bahman. Um, right. But the first, you know, after you, you, you know, with 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 Surawardi, after you cross the terrain, of the planetary terrain, um, this is the point that one unites with the active intelligence, the the uh, which is the Lord of Humanity itself, right? mm. the Atl Fa'al, which so. Which Sorvardi equates with the Zoroastrian Sarosha, or the angel Sarush, which he then equates with the Archangel Gabriel of, of um, the Abrahamic traditions. Yeah, that makes sense. But this term, Rabb Rabb Noah, do you think that this is the same as the Akbari or Ibn Arabi term uh, Ain Thabita, plural Ayan Thabita? I, I look at it to some degree that way. Um, the only difference is, is that these these are are, are animate. Yeah, that's the difference. And the yeah. same then if you talk about Platonic ideas or forms, the idea or idolon maybe in Greek, I'm not sure. They're also not animate to my knowledge. But, and mm. with Suharwadi, it's a living thing. Yeah, it's a living thing. It's completely sentient, animate. Yeah. Well, that's a huge difference. It's really fascinating. I, I really wonder, you know, what happened. And, and, and you, you wonder about Mullah Sadr as well, because he's writing these very learned ta'liqat on the Hikmat al-Ishraq, and he's got the planetary invocations in the margins there, you know. So you wonder, you really wonder. That it's, it's clear, it, it, I think it's very clear that there is a, a kind of secret college, an occult sort of brotherhood, a, a hidden kind of uh, sub rosa phenomenon that people, you know, kept very close to themselves for obvious reasons. And one, one really wonders, I mean, we don't really know for sure what Mullah Sadra's practices were. Mm. And of course he comes to a different conclusion, uh, you know, about, about the nature of, of existence and, and this whole question, but it wasn't, it was never problematized that way. Until his teacher Mir Damad, Suhra Wardi Mir no longer says that it's a asala asala to mahiya. He does you know where it says that it's that, that quiddity is fundamentally real. That's that's read into him later. And Mullah Sadr says, you know, he has this experience and then he changes his mind. Well, what was he doing out in that tiny village of what is it called? Kahak? Kahak. 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 Yeah, when he was, you know, sidelined by all of the brilliant ulama of his time. <laughs> <laughs> What was he up to all of those years? You know, Ibn al-Arabi said something beautiful. He said, um, وَمَا زَالَتَ الْفُقَهَاءَ فِي كُلِّ زَمَانٍ مَعَ الْمُحَقِّقِينَ بِمَنْزِلَةِ الْفَرَاعِنَ مَعَ النَّبِيِّينَ mm. And, you know, it, it, the, the fuqaha continue to be in every age with those who are seekers of the genuine truth, the muhaqqiqoon, um, mm. just as the pharaohs were with the prophets. Yeah, he says that in his book Ruh al Quds. So, well, yeah, the Mullah Sadra, in, at the very conclusion of his uh, Hikmat al Arshia, calls them out as Shayateen. Yes, he does. And the Hikmat al Arshia yeah. is very, very strong yeah. against them. Uh, very true. Yeah. So, we see that, that this, uh, this fate has um, this has been the fate of all of the great Muhaqqiqeen, the seekers of truth, uh, Mullah Sadra, Muhyiddin al Arabi, and certainly Shihabuddin al Suhrawardi, who met his death in Aleppo at the age of 38 lunar years. Right. right. Well, I think we go wrap it up there. It was a really illuminating discussion, Wahid. I really appreciate your taking uh, the you. time uh, and you're in a very, very different time zone to me. So it's a big, um, 
very gracious of you, and I wish you every success in all of your scholarly and endeavors. Likewise. And Likewise. I, I do hope that uh, you will be able to bring uh, to light these texts in a, in a proper edition and with a very proper translation and commentary and uh, introduce uh, Sheikh al-Ishraq, the master of illumination, and his work to a new readership, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you.